All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dan Powers, Executive Director of CoLabs, a consortium of federally funded research laboratories and joint research institutes on university campuses in Colorado. And I want to welcome you to another session of our ROI on research series, where we are visiting with prior winners of the Governor's Awards for High Impact Research to learn how their discoveries have manifested and influenced other realms of research here across Colorado, the country, and, and even the world. This morning, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Judah Levine, who is a fellow with NIST. And I want to give a little bit of background on what he was first recognized for, and then a brief biography. So you hear a little bit more of his, his background uh, in case this might be the first time that you're hearing from Dr. Levine. Very quickly, I want to give a reminder to everyone. Let me see if I can pop this forward here. I'm trying to move my, there we go. Not for you to memorize all of these, but I wanna give a quick reminder that in Colorado, we have over 30 different federally funded labs. As you glance through this, some of these research entities might be familiar to you, others, be happy to be a source of information on who they are, what they're doing, and if this catches your attention in whatever realm of research, technology, engineering, academic work that you're involved in, please reach CoLabs as we can be a connector directly into these facilities and help you find the, the best folks to connect with and perhaps find partnerships, ways to leverage your technology, and be engaged in this brilliant ecosystem of research we have in Colorado. All right, so then back to the focus here on Dr. Judah Levine. In 2009, Dr. Levine's research that led to the creation of the NIST Internet Time Service is what was spotlighted by then Governor Bill Ritter to the audience of scientists and technologists at the first annual Governor's Awards for High Impact Research event. Let me give you a little bit of the background. Now remember, this is the description in 2009. Dr. Levine developed the NIST Internet Time Service, which allows users to synchronize computer clocks via the internet. Since spearheading development of the first automated computer time service in 1988, Dr. Levine has participated in the transformation of global timekeeping. While working with other scientists at NIST, he invented services that offer the precision of atomic, atomic clock-based time to the public and to such high-tech systems as the nation's electric power grids and telecommunication networks. And the NIST Internet Time Service provides the exact time and response to more than 3 billion inquiries each day from customers like the Global Positioning System, the GPS, the stock market, and financial institutions that rely on electronic transitions. Now recall that 3 billion reference is from back in 2009. Uh, millions of people used NIST radio broadcasts to synchronize their clocks with atomic time. So a bit more background I want uh, you to know regarding Dr. Levine. He's a fellow with the National Institute of Standards and Technology and is the leader of the Network Synchronization Project in the Time and Frequency Division, which is located at the NIST laboratories here in Boulder, Colorado. He's also a fellow of JILA, which is an institute operated jointly by NIST and the University of Colorado and a member of the faculty of the Department of Physics at CU. Now the network synchroniz synchronization project operates 25 time servers at four locations and received approximately a million requests per second for time in various formats over the public internet. He also designed and implemented the time scales that define and realize UTC, and then in parentheses NIST, which is computed based on the data from an ensemble of cesium standards and hydrogen masers. This time scale is the reference for all NIST time services and is the civilian time reference for the United States. Uh, then further, the frequency of the UTC is adjusted periodically to track as computed by the BIPM and these acronyms, I'm going to let him describe to you more deeply what that means. He's also a senior member of the IEEE, IEEE, and a fellow of the American Physical Society. So with that, Dr. Levine, I'd like to turn the screen over to you. And thank you for joining us. We'd love to hear how your work has been growing and, and what's become since 2009. Oh, okay, thank you, I, I guess. Uh, 
if you stop sharing your screen, I'll start sharing my screen. Uh, it just takes me a minute here to get myself together. Uh, share screen. Uh, are you seeing the screen? Yes. Okay, let me start this. The, the, uh, uh, okay, uh, uh, thank you very much for, for, for the introduction. Uh, uh, the, I wasn't particularly going to talk about the BIPM, but it's the International Bureau of Weights and Measures in Paris, uh, and NIST, and most other countries, most the laboratories of most other countries are members of the International Bureau of Weights and Measures, and we coordinate our time scales so that all of the countries that are members transmit the same time. Uh, what I'd like to focus on today uh, is the evolution of the internet time service, uh, the then and now, then being when uh, the first award was in 2009 and now, which is sort of now. Uh, at the bottom of the screen, you can see my email address. Uh, and if, if there are points that are not clear to you or or you're welcome to ask questions now, uh, but if if there are things that are not clear or you don't get a chance to ask the question or whatever, uh, just send me an email and I'll be glad to, to answer that. Now, we run a number of different time services. Um, uh, you already mentioned the ACT service, which is a digital uh, time over uh, time service on a dial-up telephone. Uh, when, it was, when it was first done in 1988, it was a real big time thing. Of course, dial-up telephone modems and so on are not used so much anymore. Uh, so we still offer the service, but it only gets about four or five thousand calls a day now. We used to get about thirty or forty thousand calls a day. Uh, there's the web-based display, nist.time.gov, and of course we run our radio stations, uh, WWV, uh, WWVB, and WWVH. Uh, the VB station is the station. The signals from the VB station are the ones that I used for setting wall clocks and and uh, wristwatches and so on. Uh, the, the signals that are transmitted on the radio stations are also provided on a dial-up uh, talking clock thing uh, that you can dial into and hear the talk hit a time. Uh, I wasn't going to talk about any of those things particularly today uh, because they're sort of separate from the internet time service. But of course, I'll be glad to answer any questions that you might have about that. I am going to talk about the internet-based time services, which is what uh, the original award was for, and, and, and uh, to tell you how that program has evolved since 2009. Uh, and I'm going to tell you some coming attractions, um, optical fiber links, which is an extension of the internet-based time service. Uh, a lot of the publications and specifications and history and so on and so on are at the web page of the Time and Frequency Division, uh, which is tf.nist.gov and you're welcome to go there and uh, there are a very large number of publications uh, all of which are online so that you can you can uh, look whatever you like there's there's hundreds of publications uh, there's also uh, other other web pages there that have uh, references to uh, history of time and explaining a lot of the concepts that are the basis for the time distribution system uh, so the internet time services, uh, there are a number of different services. Uh, this, what, what you might call the standard network time protocol service, uh, that's our largest service. Uh, it, it has many third-party applications. Uh, it's an open protocol, that is the protocol is published. And so there've been a lot of third-party developers uh, for PCs, phones, tablets, smart devices, all sorts of stuff. Uh, uh, then, Within was is 2009. We had 35 servers and we had about 40,000 requests a second. Uh, now we have 19 servers at the four locations, and we get about a million requests a second. So we've get we're handling about 25 times as many requests with about a little more than half the number of servers. Uh, so we've gotten a lot better at offering the service. Uh, and, and the learning how to do it a lot better. The accuracy has also improved very significantly. So we get about a million requests a second. And, and that number has been pretty stable over the last few months. 
at one time it was growing about 3% a month, uh, but the growth has sort of leveled off in the last few months. It's been hovering right around a million requests a second. Uh, now, uh, in addition to the plain old, plain old network time protocol, uh, we offer an authenticated time service, uh, which is the standard network time service in which we add a digital signature and the intent of the dig digital signature is to guarantee the integrity of the message uh, and to prevent spoofing and modification of the message online. Uh, we have at the moment about 1500 registered users of that service. Uh, most of them are financial and commercial applications uh, and not all of them are in the United States. We have a significant number of, of, uh, of users, uh, mostly uh, banks uh, and the stock exchanges in other countries. We also offer a UT1 time service. Uh, if you're not an expert, you may not understand what UT1 is. Uh, it's a time scale uh, which is based on the rotation of the Earth. Uh, it's the old astronomical time scale, which is still used by astronomical applications. Uh, it differs from atomic time at the moment by about a tenth of a second. Uh, and of course, that's a varying number. It varies somewhat. Uh, and we currently have about a thousand users of uh, of that ut1 time service most of them are uh, astronomical institutions or individual astronomers uh, those services did not exist in 2009 so there's, there's no comparison for for what how the things used to be uh, in addition to the to the standard and uh, very widely used network time protocol we have a number of legacy internet services uh, the daytime protocol was the earliest protocol that we used. Uh, its main advantage was that it had a human readable text string. That is, it produced a time that you could just read uh, in the usual year, month, day format. But more importantly, it had a notice of daylight saving time, uh, the transitions in the spring and the fall. And that was very important because early computers, early PCs and Macs and so on, uh, couldn't get their act together with respect to daylight saving time. And, and having the advance notice was very important. Uh, those of you who are old enough may, may remember MS-DOS, uh, but even early versions of Windows uh, or Mac OS didn't do, leap didn't do uh, daylight saving time hardly at all. Uh, the time protocol is the simplest message format that we offer. Uh, it's simple, and so it's used by a lot of smart devices smart thermostats and smart you know doorbells and smart locks and smart this and that uh, because it's a very simple protocol uh, uh, there are no other public servers of that anymore it's it's uh we, we, nist essentially is the only place for getting that kind of time and so we are the sole support of a lot of this uh, smart hardware uh, we encourage people to switch to the better protocols uh, which I'll describe in about a minute. Uh, so then, uh, it, it, which then again, it was in 2009, there were about 10,000 requests a second, which at that time was about 25% of the, of the NTP, of the network time protocol. Uh, now we have about 30,000 requests a second, which is three times as many, but it's now only 3% of the network time protocol because there's been a significant shift in the kind of protocols that people use, which we think of as a good thing. Uh, these older protocols uh, have problems. Uh, the, the client software is often very poorly written. Uh, it's written by you know, people in garage companies or something that do a very poor job. So that, that the change uh, to the network time protocol is really a very, very welcome thing. Uh, in some day, some time in the future, we might stop providing the time protocol uh, but whenever we do so, whenever we propose changing the time protocol, we get a lot of complaints from the various, you know, Internet of Things, smart things kind of thing. That, well, no, 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 we really need it. We really need it. So it's, it's going to continue for the, for the foreseeable future. Uh, now, in addition to the Internet-based time services, which are public, that is, they, they're provided on the public network, uh, we have uh, started offering uh, optical fiber services uh, and these use dedicated connections to client systems. That is, they're not, they're not public networks, they're dedicated connections. that are a direct connection between a client system and the one of the reference time scales, either the one in Gaithersburg, Maryland, 
uh, the NIST headquarters or the one in Boulder, the, the time scale here. Uh, the, because the circuit is dedicated, we can characterize it better. Uh, it has a greater accuracy than the public network. Uh, it can provide microsecond or even nanosecond level services, uh, which are, are not, not so important in 2009, but are now becoming very much more important. Uh, it has, of course, improved reliability because it doesn't suffer from the, the outages and problems with the public network, uh, which are, are unfortunately more common than you think. Uh, uh, the most important aspect and the thing that's really driving this requirement is the independent of signals from GPS. Uh, the, there is an increasing concern about interference with GPS. Some of it is intentional, some of it is non-intentional, some of it is accidental, um, but it's an increasingly serious problem. And, and uh, there has been a strong push uh, by both the previous administration, the current administration, to develop uh, methods uh, for transmitting time that do not depend on the GPS satellites. Uh, we have completed a demonstration uh, of this system uh, the link was from Gaithersburg, Maryland, the NIST headquarters in Gaithersburg, Maryland, uh, to Atlanta, Georgia, with a stop in McLean, Virginia. Uh, that's a distance of about 800 kilometers, more or less, uh, you know, 500 miles or something. Uh, and and uh, that was that was a test system, uh, and that was done about a year ago. Uh, the coming attractions that we're proposing now are uh, a link from Gaithersburg, Maryland, to the stock exchange market market computer system, uh, which is in New Jersey. And the stock market itself is in New York, so there'll be a double link, one to New York Stock Exchange and one to the computing facility, which is in New Jersey. Uh, we're also talking about a link from Boulder to Silicon Valley, uh, which would run through San Jose. Uh, I expect that that those systems are, are we're currently in the planning stages of them. And, and I think uh, we, we'll probably be ready to run those uh, I don't know, maybe sometime next summer. Uh, these services will be microsecond accuracy, uh, which means that at the remote users will know the time to within about a microsecond, uh, and sub-microsecond stability, which means that there'll be the jitter and the time will be less than less than, much significantly less than a microsecond. Uh, the most important aspect is that these signals will be independent of GPS, uh, which is is an important requirement uh, for these kind of accuracy signals. Uh, now, th there are a whole bunch of applications which require this level of accuracy. Uh, the stock market, stock market uh, financial regulators now require millisecond level trans uh, timestamps, and both the telecom and power industry also have uh, increasingly stringent requirements for accuracy, uh, in both time and in frequency. So let me summarize where we are. We have multiple time servers at different locations, and of course the intention is uh, to provide no single point of failure uh, so that these systems are independent of each other and, and uh, there's no way of uh, any single point stopping the whole network. Uh, we have a number of different message formats that are open source, uh, which means they're published, and there are many third party implementations. We, we uh, work with third parties. Uh, to try to help them develop applications and and uh, we encourage that kind of stuff. Uh, we have support support for multiple meshes formats, as I've described. Um, there are different requirements for different users. Uh, there is an authenticated system and a non-authenticated system. Uh, there are different different sophistications for the ranging from the network time protocol, which is the fanciest protocol protocol that we offer, out to the time protocol, which is the simplest protocol that we offer. Uh, uh, for those requirements of, of higher accuracy, uh, with, we're, we're developing optical fiber services, and our customers will be mostly telecom, uh, electric power distribution, and and uh, financial transactions in the stock exchange. So that's all. Uh, uh, that's where we are, and I'd be glad to to answer as many questions as you as you have. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Levine. All right, as uh, comments are coming in from there, I wanted to ask regarding these, these coming attractions as you listed them out, what manner of public engagement is there 
are there working groups or uh, some type of hearing or ways that people can informally get involved in conversations with you? Oh, well, the, the uh, uh, NIST has published a thing called the Special Calibration Test, uh, which is uh, intended to invite uh, customers or users to learn more about the fiber, the fiber tests. Uh, we have we have given uh, you know talks at all the various conferences and so on. Uh, it's it's clearly the coming thing. That is, uh, I mean, we will support this, but uh, this is certainly not uh, you know something which which nobody else has thought of because the the problems of, of jamming and spoofing of GPS are are, are serious. Uh, so that that. Uh, there are there are a number of different proposals to provide uh, something that's independent of GPS, which could be, I mean, a fiber solution is one solution. There are a number of there are a number of different proposals, but but we're pushing the fiber solution is probably the best one of them all. All right, and I did put up into the the uh, the chat column for the audience, the tf.nist.gov link. And so I know there's much more information there people can get to. Quick question that's coming from David is, uh, how does the microsecond time delivery to the New York Stock Exchange impact the issues of micro trading? Well, uh, I think that's a very good question. Uh, the the, the, uh, the micro trading uh, is not, in first order at least, it's not sensitive to the absolute correct time it's sensitive more to time interval uh, that is the idea of a, of a micro trade is that you buy something and you sell it very quickly uh, and, and so uh, the absolute time at which you've done the transaction uh, you usually don't require the nanosecond level accuracy for the absolute time you require microsecond level accuracy for for the timestamp so that 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 my guess is that microsecond that that uh, high frequency trading is not going to be affected in first order. Uh, they will continue to buy and sell as fast as they possibly can, uh, and they, but they're not sensitive to the absolute time at which it happens. I see. All right. Question from Felix: Could you please comment on where PTP fits in relative to NTP and fiber links? Okay, well, PTP uh, is another standard protocol, and and it is something that we are going to use on the fiber links. That it is one of the possibilities for for using it on the fiber links. Uh, in general, it cannot be used on the public internet, and the reason for that is that uh, the public internet is a switched system. That is, you don't have a direct connection between point A and point B. You go from point A to some switch some intermediate switch and then to another intermediate switch and another intermediate switch. And, and those intermediate switches interfere with the PTP protocol because there's no way of measuring the delay through the switch. Uh, now uh, there are, it is possible to get hardware uh, that is network hardware, which is PTP aware, but generally speaking, the public network doesn't have it. So that, PTP is going to be used on the private networks. It's 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 one of the two or three possibilities that we're going to put on the private networks. But in general, you can't be used on the public network unless the public network is PTP aware, which is generally not the case for the for typical networks. Hmm. All right. I wondered if you could elaborate on what would be the benefit of linking Boulder to San Jose slash Silicon Valley? Who who's really requesting that, so, or would benefit from it? Well, I, I think the, the answer is that that there are a lot of uh, clock development companies and 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 uh, hardware manufacturers there who have expressed an interest in it. Uh, now we are dealing with a third party provider. That is, we are dealing with with someone who is going to provide the, the reference station in San Jose. Uh, so we're not gonna be dealing with the end users, you know, with the actual endpoint customers. Uh, so the answer is, I don't know who the endpoint customers are gonna wind up being, uh, but in general, it's gonna be uh, the clock manufacturers who need to be able to characterize their devices. Uh, but but uh, uh, stay tuned and, and uh, come back in a year and I'll tell you. Okay. 
Could you also tell us what you've perceived as the evolution of the precision of of timekeeping of uh, and how how this is actually all shared and the technology behind it? What has changed since two thousand nine or the or the two thousands? Well, I think that the uh, I think there are some things that haven't changed. Uh, for example, the widespread use of GPS uh, hasn't really changed, if anything, uh, and, and, and it, it, I think the concerns, so, so that the GPS system hasn't really changed. Uh, the, the, uh, the, internet, the internet time service uh, has gotten a little bit better, but in many ways it's limited by the increased congestion on the network. Uh, the, the, uh, especially for for uh, well, well, let me explain that. The, see, the way we measure the delay on the network is we send packets in both directions. That is, we send a message and an outbound message and an inbound message, and we measure the elapsed time, and then we divide that by two, and that's the one-way path. And and that doesn't work so well for many of the applications which have large one-way transmissions. Uh, for example. Um, at the University of Colorado, we, we have a lot of students who spend their days watching movies, uh, you know, and, and uh, if they sit in a dorm and watch a movie on some commercial channel, well, that, that interferes with the network delay. I shouldn't should say, it, it makes it difficult, I shouldn't say interferes, that's, maybe that's a loaded term. It, it, it makes it more difficult to get an accurate measure of the network delay. So that, that, that the the network delay although we've gotten very much clever at how we do these things uh the 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 uh increase the, the network delay is still a major problem and and so it's hard to do better than a few milliseconds uh, on the public network uh, mm. and in fact if you're unlucky you can do worse than that uh you know there are some wi-fi connections for example that are tend to be rather poor uh, uh but so i think that's what you've identified as one of the one of the reasons why the optical fiber circuits are becoming, uh, you know, the next step, because because we've reached we've come to the end or we're coming near the end of how well we can do on the public network and the requirements keep increasing, mm. uh, and and that's one of the drivers for the for the private network solution, uh, and that the the second driver of course is the increasing concern about about interference with GPS, which is a, an increasing problem. Okay, thank you. I have a, then a, a follow-up, uh, perhaps a, a last question here. Uh, David's saying thank you for your, your crystal clear answer before. He wants to follow up with a, even more going deep uh, in, sure. into your answer. Um, couldn't the manifold financial inequities of microtrading be eliminated by requiring all transactions be accompanied by a registered NIST timestamp. Is that a political pipe dream? Uh, that's above my pay grade. Uh, I, 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 uh, uh, with all due respect, uh, you got to remember that NIST and the University of Colorado are not the police department of time. Uh, you know, we, we can't. I, I, I. You know, micro trading is going to go on with or without me, uh, <laughs> and 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 I don't. Uh, I just I think that you know, uh, whether micro trading is a good thing or a bad thing is sort of outside of the scope of the time and frequency division. Right. Yes, you're you're focused on the uh, actually the engineering and technology of it, not necessarily well, we, how it gets. Well, yeah. Gets I mean, used, right? yeah. I think. I think we can do what we can do, and 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 uh, uh, I think our our in fact uh, the place where I think we are going to make the greatest impact is on uh, telecom and power transfer, and, and especially long distance power transfer, uh, which is uh, which is a difficult business. You have to kind of synchronize the generators over a wide area, uh, and that's a hard job. That, that, that's not that's not an easy thing to do. Okay, well, thank you. You know, we are out to time here. I know people have your contact info, and we've shared the uh, the website that you had referenced. 
And a quick, uh, a quick thank you came in from David. Thanks for that further answer there. Uh, Dr. Levine, thanks for your time today and for giving us some more food for thought and reasons to connect in with the research of the time and frequency division. Uh, Let me encourage people to send emails to the address. Uh, uh, I'd be glad to answer more questions if there are any more questions. Uh, so, you know, don't be embarrassed about that. I do that all the time. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, thank you all then. And thanks to the audience for joining us for this, uh, this uh, quick, boy, time goes by fast. No, no, no sort of uh, pun intended okay. in talking with a, a, a brilliant expert here on uh, the time and frequency division, but thanks for your time. And we're glad to bring you back to the audience of the Collabs Network and remind them both what was being recognized many years ago and how this has continued to manifest forward as one of those fundamental first world technologies that help enable so many other activities that we're all involved in that we probably don't know about or take for granted. Uh, I wanna say thanks to you for being one of those brilliant people behind the scenes sure. in some ways, Dr. Levine, who've, who've enabled our lives. Uh, sure. And I say that very sincerely. Okay, thanks, bye. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Oh, and we'll make this available online, too. So I'll follow up with an email out to our network where you can see this online. Thanks.